Welcome back to State of Decay 2 and my Lethal Builder run. Uh, this is the second of my new recruits. My last episode was all about the first one, running around and trying some of the new features from Update 36. Uh, let me try to equip this one a little better. So, okay, we've got a shotgun. That's not going to be great. Let's, uh, ooh, Echo 1 Wraith. Uh, stealth Sword, that's pretty cool. But actually, you know what I want to do? My base has become very difficult to come home to because it is just constantly surrounded by a zillion zombies. I feel like there's got to be something I can do about that. So let's see, like, what? So I don't have any 357 weapons. Um, so I can't use that. But I think my most common bullets are 45 and 22. So let's... Okay, so the fake A47... That's a really good 22 rifle, and it's got a break on it. And then let's grab a 45 pistol, like this suppressed F45 tactical. And what I'd like to do is just go out into the world and just see how many zombies near my base I can murder. Um, and I figure, I mean... You know, I've gotten a lot of characters killed recently. I would not be surprised if I also got this character killed trying to do this. But I don't know. I just, I, I feel like, you know, if, 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 if there's a safe enough place to take a brand new character that doesn't have a lot of experience and give them some experience, it's got to be near the base, right? So I'm going to load up these guns. And also this gun. And then, wait, do I have an attachment? What's on here? Right, professional. Okay, so I've got a break on this rifle. I've got a suppressor on this pistol. So I've got both options, loud and quiet. And do I have anything particularly good at fighting a juggernaut? I mean, not extremely. Um, oh, one thing I've also been doing is I'm, I'm trying to get my... Um, get my base producing food at its usual high rate again, because I let some things fall by the wayside. I don't have enough influence to upgrade any of these guys. Yeah, it takes 2,000 and a bunch of materials, which I don't have. So we'll save that. But oh, another thing I could do, though, give this character some extra health and infection resistance. I did just bring home some meds. This might be a little bit wasteful because maybe I should save this for Plague Hearts. Whatever, it's fine. So, I just want to have a nice little relaxing time shooting some zombies without getting my character murdered. So, what I'll probably do is... What will I do? Let's start with this side. Let's clear out these you know, bloaters and a horde with... Oh, this is a horde of three screamers. And then let's attract this juggernaut back to the base to get some help from my friends. I should I should actually mark these guys. Let's mark the nearby guy. The one who's most likely to sneak up on me. Wait, where did I... Sorry, I, I was looking over the chat. Have I just lost my mind? Okay. No, it's... Oh, right. I keep forgetting. There's no Z-axis on our um, marker. So I was looking down to try to see the marker, but actually it was just floating over his head. Oh, there's a feral coming at me. Oh, look at this guy. Come on, buddy. Where are you? Oh, dang it! That was quick. All right. Come here. Come into base. Hey, everybody. Feral time. Oh, you're just going to run up and smack him? I mean, sure. Why not? Get him! Get him! 
<laughs> All right. Anyway, you guys think you can do the same thing with a uh, juggernaut? He's getting real close. Hey, buddy. Oh, I failed a mission I didn't care about. Cool. Oh, he's going to come in through here. Okay, everybody. Uh, come here. Come on, gather around. I'd rather use your bullets and mine, because they're free. I'm only going to start contributing if he looks like he's going to kill somebody. This is, in theory, the best way to deal with a juggernaut. You get multiple people shooting bullets at him that don't exist. And then you get to do the coup de grace. All right, that was cool. Who else we got? We got some stream... Uh, some, I almost called them streamers. That's what I am. We've got some screamers down here. And I just realized I've got a bounty to kill screamers with fire. And what do you know? I've got fire. So the question is, oh, gosh. Where are they? Oh, there they are. They're in the water. They're like literally standing in the water. And I'm pretty sure that water causes problems for fire. There's a third one. Okay, yeah, so all these zombies are coming after me because of that noise I just made. There is another... Oh, he was just really far from his friends. There's another screamer down there. Which, who's that? Not a screamer. Okay. He could be in the rock. But he could also be behind the rock. Starting to get, oops, starting to get kind of dark. Maybe future editor Jeffrey should uh, try to brighten the screen a little bit. Hmm. Okay, I don't want to like step off a cliff and then be stuck surrounded by zombies. Where is this guy? Yeah, I'm I'm getting increasingly convinced that he's inside the rock. <laughs> I can hear him. He's in the rock. Okay, great. Well, at least he can't see me. Oh. Cool. Now he's going to be just making that noise all the time. Oh, gosh. Stop. Get off me. Okay. Okay, so the zombies have been running this direction, which means this must be the way to get, get back up. Oh, my gosh. There's so many of you. And I am so much sicker than I expected to be. What, what is the way up? This place is built on a cliff. So remember the thing I was saying about how my character will be really super safe as long as they stay near home. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, of course, there's a feral. Stay out there. I'll let my friends deal with you. I'm going to find the infirmary. Where do we keep our infirmary? Ah, uh, yeah, the far right. Let's, um... Infection therapy. There we go. Not infected anymore, as long as I don't get completely sick. I can always come back to my infirmary and just spend one plague sample resolving my infection, which is great. Okay, so this screamer, I'm just not going to be able to do anything with. That bloater I might be able to kill, though. The bloater was probably summoned by the screamer. Where are you? There you are. Okay, bloater taken care of. Another juggernaut, of course. 
whatever. Okay, so this is another three screamers over here. So what I think, maybe what I want to do is, let's aim for this feral. Though actually, before I get into that conflict, let's take a little break because I've fallen way behind in the chat and uh, I should see what some people are saying. So Sinister Plank says, I once had a mission to kill a specific screamer. I think it was a Zed Hunter Enclave. And that screamer kept spawning inside a rock, even after restarts. That sounds very frustrating. Luckily, I'm pretty sure that most of our that our missions are actually incapable of recognizing specific freaks. So if you get a mission that says, go kill this feral, go kill this juggernaut, go kill this screamer, and it's not working for whatever reason, I think you can go kill any other one of the same type, and I think the mission will still recognize it. Little behind the scenes there because our missions like the game literally doesn't differentiate between different zombies uh, it doesn't know which one is which it can't reference them can't like cast a zombie then reference that same zombie in a mission all it can do is recognize the action of killing that type of zombie so i think you could probably get away with it <laughs> sinister play says i also had uh, a zombie somehow spawn underneath my starter base in drucker uh in this run it would just be under there making noise i had to deal with that until i moved okay that's pretty messed up oh haxwell said the other day i had that same bounty the killing screamers with fire bounty uh equipped and it somehow completed by itself and he was confused then he realized he had mines set up around an outpost and apparently Mines count as fire damage, which they do. Yeah, they are. That is fire damage, and so so they, just his mines were passively killing screamers all the time whenever a horde went by, and uh, and he was just getting the credit for it. That's pretty. I'm glad it works that way. Um. So sinister says, well, it, but the upside of of having a screamer under his base constantly attracting other zombies was that he got his melee skills up fast. So that's cool. Um. Jawafawa and Sinister are also talking about how uh, Drucker is their favorite map. Uh, Sinister Plank says, I just love the Drucker uh, terrain. It really rewards player map knowledge, but the other maps just don't. Yeah, that, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think, I mean, it's, yeah, all of the maps have got their complications. Meager is probably the least complex in terms of just, like, needing to understand the map in order to get places. Drucker is probably the most complex. But yeah, it is, it is rewarding. Like, I, I have, when a map is complex, you know, that also makes it, more memorable to some degree because like for instance in Drucker like I've missed turns obviously you've seen me miss turns in these episodes but I also am vaguely aware of what like where each turn leads because I had to learn it I had to really learn it in order to understand how to navigate the map a map like Meager which is just more wide open you can just go as the crow flies you don't really have to understand the road network at all and so Drucker does sort of encourage you to actually learn how the map works um, though sometimes complexity can work against you in Cascade Hills there's this one intersection where for some reason I cannot figure out which way is north, south, east, and west. And similarly, by the bridge fort. I always think the bridge fort is pointing the opposite direction from the way it's pointing. I've got no idea why. I've just somehow got it psychologically ingrained in myself, the wrong rotation. And I just can't fix it. I don't. I, I keep trying to study it, learn it, remember it, and I just can't. I don't know why. Um, and so that's, that's a mystery for a level designer to figure out, like why somebody could just get the wrong orientation of something in their heads and have no idea what to do about it. You know, it might be there are two bridges next to each other in the bridge fort. And it could be that because when I think of the two bridges, I think of being at the bridge fort, my home, and looking at the other one. And I also have a preset in my head of thinking of the direction I'm looking as north. So it could be that, and I could be wrong. I could, I could actually have this backwards. I'm describing something wrong. But my theory that I want to test now by going back to one of my Cascade games is that if the bridge fort is north of another bridge... I could be getting turned around because I keep assuming that it's south of the other bridge because of the way I just sort of make assumptions in my brain without thinking about them. I could see that being the case. Paroxica says that Drucker is the most fun for him to play on. Uh, Meager is, to him, the most picturesque. Those moments when you can't see any evidence of the, of the zombie apocalypse, the aesthetics of that map are breathtaking. That might be one of the reasons why I like it, too. I, I agree with you that Meager is one of the prettiest things that's been in State of Decay. Something about like sort of like just the big like sort of the rolling verdant terrain w broken up by these really tall uh, wind farms. Oh, I'm getting a public safety alert about a missing child. Yikes! I hope I don't think I can contribute to helping with that, but uh, I hope whoever it is 
turns out okay. Um, Sinister Blank says that Cascade is probably their second favorite. That makes sense. If 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 what you like about terrain is complexity, Cascade being your second favorite makes a lot of sense. Thanks to Drucker. Emma Haxwell Gaming says that uh, Cascade just looks like the place where he's from, and so and so that's that's an argument in its favor. Uh, and Sinister says actually ambiance wise over meager, he actually prefers Providence, that sort of like Pacific Northwest Oregon esque uh appearance uh you know just sort of yeah it's it's meant to be sort of like a kind of a misty wet feeling place uh which kind of has a different give it, gives it a different vibe from some of the others anyway okay so let's let's get back into the game and uh explore a little bit more so okay so what i want to do is kill this feral if i can kill the screamer near him with fire that's great but the priority is the feral. He's moving around so much. I need to get a headshot. Okay. Oh, crap. Bunch of zombies. Okay. Got him. Oh, didn't get his brother. Hey, everybody. Got a friend. Oh, he doesn't know where I am anymore. Oh, now he does. All right. Oh, but he brought his buddies. Everybody's here. Ow! So I keep having this, like, impulse that I should be able to sort of run away while keeping my my eye on the zombies. But in your base, I mean, your base is always full of bunches and bunches of, like, obstacles, furniture, stuff like that. And so whenever I try to run away from a zombie, like, in the direction of the camera, I always end up bumping into something and getting screwed up. Let me see. Okay, I think I've done all the stuff I can do in the garden. I've turned on the water. So that means that my food is now up to plus 20 a day. <laughs> what? Oh, no. A well. Oh, it's plus 20 a day because of a curveball. We've got a well oiled machine. Better food and meds production. Overall base noise reduced. Cheaper to form. <laughs> okay, I was like, 20 and that's stupid. <laughs> like, what are you even talking about? Um, so it looks like, for some reason, my meds. My meds are only showing plus one a day. What? Hold on a second. That seems odd. Mary's plus one a day. Meds outpost is plus two. That's three a day total. The infirmary is down two a day. So it's plus one. It's just showing plus one for meds. Is that... And my outpost is supposed to be plus two a day, right? Like... Not possible. Yeah, it's plus two a day. So it's not being magnified? That's kind of odd, right? Oh, Sinister Plank says it doesn't double outposts. It only doubles things inside i guess facilities is only double facilities well then i feel like it shouldn't appear in this list that way <laughs> if, if it's only doubling the facilities i can see it now okay now i can see under garden three garden three has its normal plus nine a day that it does but then it also has a plus 18 a day that is coming from the well-oiled machine so if that if well-oiled machine was helping with meds it would it would show a double entry for something else I feel like there might be a more elegant way to show that, but also implementing a more elegant way would probably be freaking complicated knowing how this works under the hood. So that's cool. I get it. Makes sense. Um, all right. So we took care of that screamer. Uh, sorry, that, that feral. Now, there's these three screamers. I think before I get into a bunch of trouble with a bunch of other zombies, especially with other screamers, I should try to kill these three screamers with fire. Uh, 
Excuse me, madam. Oh, you just... What? Oh, oh, man. I'm over here. Oh, oh, where did I go? Where did I go? Okay, whatever. Oh, bloater. Oh, I heard that one coming. Wow, okay, how many shots did I think that should take? Oh, great. Oh, it's... They're in the rock again! Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm gonna try something. Yes! I killed two of them! The fire actually went through the rock. That's kind of cool. Hey, buddy. I'm doing so badly with this gun. I, I think I'm just... I think I'm just spoiled by... Whatever. I think I'm just spoiled by gunslinging. Stay off me. All right. This gun's not in the best shape. Okay, so I haven't killed everything. But we've made a difference. Like, this place isn't nearly as dangerous as it used to be. And... Oh, hi! <laughs> okay, 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 hold. Stop it. Get off. Please don't set my cars on fire. Okay, who's left? Oh, bunches of ya. Bunches and bunches. Okay, you know what? Oh, Feral. Everybody, I need backup. I feel like this episode is about the power of teamwork. <laughs> like, I keep getting myself into way too much trouble. Into situations where, in a previous episode, I would have just been summarily killed. But then I bring in the whole group, we work together, and we just fix it. Oh, yeah, well, mostly. Oh, gosh. All right. Come on, everybody. Okay, this is a lot of zombies. <laughs> this is an awful lot of zombies. Okay, broke my gun. That's cool. Sheesh. This is like, it's funny, these hordes that we keep getting in the lethal zone, they're like worse than a siege. Like I usually don't have a siege that's this intense. Because sieges are usually very carefully meted out, you know, we're like very cautious about 
you know, how many zombies we bring in, in what order, that sort of thing. But when it's just a bunch of randos? Yeah, I don't know. All right, let's grab ourselves a different pistol at least. I want to hold on to that one. I, I mean, repairing it would be expensive, but it's also a fancy gun, so... I'm going to keep it. Hey, I actually meant to put this away. There we go. Um, do I have... I mean, I've got a bunch of weapons that I'm never going to use, right? I picked up like three of these and I never even used one of them, the Halligan tools. Two maces, don't need both of them. Crowbars are thick on the ground. Do I need two skillets? Yes, obviously. Um, I like to have, kind of have one of almost everything. Not every everything, but almost everything. Parang. All right. Do we have anything else I want to kill amongst the guns? Just some that just aren't that interesting. Okay, this advanced suppressor is cool. And luckily, now that we're at update 36, I can just attach the mod from it immediately. And then salvage it. It's not that interesting. Um, what else have we got that's not that interesting? Um, keeping the golden vulture, obviously. Hunter's Mod 70. Nah. Are these both regular-ass AK-47s? Yeah, I don't need two of those. I've got two Howlitzers. Oh, whatever. Two light crossbows. Don't need both of them. Okay, so now, am I in a position to repair that one gun? Just because I don't like seeing red here. Yep. All right. Whew. Anyway, so how's our map looking now? Hey, this is much more survivable. I think we've got... Oh, that horde has got a juggernaut in it. And of course, there's... Okay, it's not great, right? But it's better than it was. And I'm feeling pretty good about it. I kind of just wanted to do a short episode anyway, you know? And so uh, training this character... What is this character's name again? Hold on. What's her name? Darla, that's right. So training Darla, clearing out some of the crowds around my base, that feels worthwhile. Let's, let's have a look at the chat again, see what I'm missing. I'm sure it's a bunch. Let's see here. Oh, so uh, Orathaus and Sinister Plank are talking about the fact that the Providence Ridge, one of our maps, um, it's got a lot more impassable terrain in the way than some of the others. That is true. Um... Oh yeah, so uh, Coalition is pointing out that uh, that he started a bet last episode uh, about whether or not I was going to get fully infected, get killed, or blow up a car, or none of the above. It looks like it was none of the above. Two solid episodes without me getting anyone killed because I did almost exclusively non-risky things. <laughs> so you know what I'm going to have to do. I mean, next next episode I'm going to have to probably go after a plague heart or something, something a little bit more dangerous because I've been I've been you know chilling a little bit maybe a little bit too much um so yeah so we got a lot of like wow reactions to well-oiled machine and how much food it was creating so yeah so that's the thing about like doubling your food output even at the base it's like because i was i, I already had to produce so much food just to feed my people because this is the lethal zone they're all really hungry it meant that doubling that suddenly like it basically inverted the equation <laughs> and like suddenly I'm producing as much as I was, you know, making up for. Um, and so, yeah, so hopefully well the machine lasts just long enough that I'll have a morning and I'll get a payout before it goes away. Cause that's the thing I imagine if well the machine takes place mostly between, between dawn and dusk, maybe it would, would it affect the payout at all? I, we do kind of prorate it. Like if, like if, if your income changes, between dawn and dusk or dusk and dawn we do give you credit for that either for a drop or for an increase and so and that's one of the reasons why 
the numbers are really unpredictable. Is that why like I, I might not want to do it the same way in the future. Uh, the numbers are really unpredictable part because we're, we're actually trying to handle all of the changes that you can make between two payoffs at different times of day. And so, so the numbers that you actually get are often just wildly off what you might expect because just so many, we're handling so many different things in the math. Um, and so I don't actually know. So it could be that even if it doesn't, even if that curveball doesn't last through dawn, I might still see some benefit from it. Yeah, Sinister Plank says, uh, Gunslinging can very quickly become a clut uh, become a crutch. There's nothing wrong with using it, but if you rely on it, then it causes you problems with the characters. Yeah, I just got really used to just, I mean, I got I got to say, like, I think that the work that the programmers in our game did at, like, making zombie heads aim at a bowl, I mean, it's actually really difficult. Uh, people don't run, because there's so many teams who have gotten very good at doing, um, like, aiming with a controller, um... A lot of players take it for granted and don't realize how difficult that actually is. Like the first few games that tried it, uh, like like Halo was probably the best early on, and then Call of Duty was this, was another really good one early on, um, and they sort of set the standard that became like good uh, aim controls uh, with, with with the controller. But for a long, long time, almost everyone else was garbage. And and not because it, just because it's a really really hard problem to solve, um, and if you've never solved it before, there's you, you don't even know what, where where to start, um, and, and so there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes that you might not notice how much work the game is doing to make it easier for you to aim at those zombies, and so um, uh, so yeah, so if you use gunslinging a lot, like you can lose your skills, but really what your skill at aiming at zombies heads is it's not just you being good at aiming at zombie heads it's you be good at being good at understanding how the game works you being good at understanding like like you you sort of like you've you've made a uh, a, a sort of instinctual unspoken like relationship unarticulated relationship with the game's controls you've gotten really used to how it feels to try to aim at a zombie's head and you anticipate it with your thumbs and you know exactly what to do and uh, and you can get really good at aiming with a controller in this game because there's so many helps so many things making it easier for you under the surface um but if you don't do it for a while, or you play, for instance, like me, play Helldivers all the time for a while, um, you get used to how it feels in a different game. In Helldivers, you're very rarely trying to precisely aim at an enemy's head. You're trying to wildly fire in their general direction, and enough of your shots hit that that they die. Um, and and so it's just it's a it's a different feel and different priorities, and their cursor works in a very different way because they they separate where you're trying to aim from the actual destination. They have two cursors that you're lining up. And so, like, I've just gotten out of the habit of the way you have to think about Sado Decay 2. So between gunslinging becoming a habit and, you know, me just getting out of the habit of, like, actually trying to aim in this game, it was getting difficult for me. So I, I might need to practice uh, in, in here a little bit more. All right. So it looks like the winners of the bet were Paroxicus and Quintarius Quincy, who bet that none of the above would happen. I mean, I tried to warn when the bet began, I did try to warn you that I was going to be taking very little risk, uh, both in the last episode and in this one. So if you bet that I was going to get killed, I mean, that's not crazy, you know, uh, because I did surprisingly get killed. I surprised myself by getting killed like five times in the past, like six episodes or something. So you were going with the odds, but at the same time, I mean, I was consciously trying to avoid to get into trouble, and I was pretty straightforward about that. So, you know, if Quintarius, Quincy, and Paroxicus have your points, uh, I, I don't think I don't think I take the full blame for that. Um, Coalition suggests I says I would love it for players to be able to extend positive curveballs. I mean, like to notice a curveball is going on and then invest in it in some way to make it last longer. I could see that being being really interesting. Like it's still opportunistic, um, but uh, you know, so it still has the randomness to it. But you can also decide what you like. So Jawa Fala was uh, was congratulating me getting no deaths in the Lethal Zone for two solid episodes, which is yeah, like I used to go a long time in the Lethal Zone without getting without getting killed. My previous run, that's kind of how it went. This time, I've been having a lot of trouble lately. Yeah, Sinister, Sinister Plank says I've never had a single problem with State of Decay 2's aiming. Yeah, that and that is a lot of work on the part of our programmers. Like, like seriously, uh, I, I'm impressed at what they've been able to pull off. Between that and like Dan Mode's tuning of our vehicles, which is also unusually good. Like, there's some some real experts 
uh, working on this team. And... Oh, yeah, so Sinister Plank uh, is telling Orthos, the main reason I'm really bad at aiming is because of arthritis and, es and essential tremor. Uh, so I really enjoy it when I can use gunslinging, uh, but, but it's just not a reliable option. Um, and so that's, so actually that makes me feel really good, Sinister Plank, to, to hear that like, you know, someone like you who actually traditionally might, might, might struggle with aiming because of, you know, problems like arthritis. If you've been having a good time with the aim in State of Decay 2, that makes me feel like the game is like, like is extra successful. Cause I think that, you know, one of the things, and again, I, I can brag on it because I didn't implement this part of it. I had nothing to do with how our aim works. Um, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm impressed by our own programmers. Uh, but I think that one of the reasons why I think it's really valuable for uh, game developers to focus on as, uh, uh, to focus on um, accessibility is because of the curb cut effect is because of that idea that when you make something work for someone who has you know some kind of special need or some kind of special challenge if you make it good enough for them then not only is it good enough for them and does it, does it open the door to let them enjoy the game, but also you make it twice as good for everyone else. Like, and, and, and that's just, an, I mean, it's not like, you know, uh, there's a, there's a little bit of implicit unfairness to that, but it's not coming from you. It's just, you know, in order, you really have to up your game in order to make your game accessible to people who are facing like personal challenges, engaging with your game, you have to make your game twice as good as it would have been if you just ignored that concern. Um, and so it, like, it's a way to make a game feel much, much more polished is if you say like, no, this game doesn't just have to be good for the typical player who sits down and picks up a controller. This game has to be good for the person who most expects themselves not to be able to enjoy it. If you can make it good enough for them, then you've definitely made it good, good enough for everyone else. And, uh, and so, and, and both of both the goal of making the game accessible to that person and the goal of making your game more polished for everybody else, those are both worthy goals. And I think, so, so I think that that focus on accessibility is just, it's good for everyone. And so whenever somebody like takes like a resentful, like zero sum attitude where they get this, this feeling, I don't know, some gamers, I think get this feeling of, oh, if you're focusing on accessibility, then you're not focusing on me and I'm the most important person in your audience. You know, they don't get it. The game, so many games have gotten so much better for you, self-centered gamer, um, because of the focus on accessibility. It has been massively beneficial for you, even if you don't recognize it. Um, so... <laughs> Anyway, uh, maybe I, I I didn't mean to get quite as salty as I ended up getting about that, but it just it just I don't know it just annoys me, right? Like it, it, the the huge strides that I as a designer and we as a developer and just the industry in general has taken because of the focus on accessibility. It's just it's so undeniable to me that it bugs me when people don't appreciate it when people like try to you know act like that's some kind of problem when it's like it's making everything better for you. Like calm down. Uh, Lequilla student asks uh, if I've watched, if I've seen blind playthroughs of games, like literally blind. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I haven't watched a lot, but I do, um, uh, we, we got connected to several people who had various, uh, you know, various disabilities, including blindness, uh, when we did our, uh, inclusive design sprint a while ago. And so, and I did get to watch, you know, people, or at least hear about people who were blind and what their experience was playing our game. And, uh, and it is really interesting to, to see sort of because most people who are blind aren't like 100% like there's literally no signal going into the visual center of their brains. Most people, it's just they're blind enough that they effectively can't see, but they can see enough that there is something that they can do in a video game to make it so that they can play it. Um, and so, so there's actually a large number of players out there who are, who are legally blind, who still enjoy video games. Um, and, and so, and that's something that, you know, if you don't realize that you might not realize that that's actually a direction that your game can improve, that you can actually make a, you know, consciously make your game more accessible to that part of the audience. And again, that not only makes it more accessible to that part of the audience, it makes it more accessible for someone who's playing on a screen that's set too far away from them. And it also, you know, makes a game more playable by somebody who whatever is, 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 has visual processing issues and gets distracted really easily by visuals. Like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different things that, you know, somebody who ostensibly can see just fine, um, can run into that, you know, if you make, if you try to make your game accessible to the person who can barely see at all, then you make the game better for all of those other people in all those other situations as well. It's just great for everyone. 
Sinister Plink says, as someone whose entire entertainment in life relies on good eyesight, that's amazing to me. Uh, yeah, so, so that is, it, like, you know, as my eyes have gotten worse as I've gotten older, I wear bifocals now. Um, it's, you know, it's been interesting to me realizing how reliant I've been on sight, on things like, you know, like, I do have, I think, you know, I'm undiagnosed, but I've been noticing that I feel like I either am developing or maybe have always had some degree of audio processing issues. And it really helps me to, for instance, have, to, for instance, have um, subtitles up when I'm watching a TV show or playing a game. I, I, I just always turn them on by default because it helps me so much to like understand what's going on. And um, when I'm when I'm doing it without my glasses, I can't read the subtitles, and I also effectively can't hear the dialogue. Um, in, in a lot of cases, I mean, I can hear some of it, but you know, and, and part of it is audio processing issues. Part of it is. You know, I've got a lot of kids making noise. Um, and so, or either they're making noise or they're asleep while I'm watching a show and I have to turn it way down. Or I'm up in my living room with an older television. It just doesn't have really good speakers. And so, you know, there's lots of different reasons why I need to have those subtitles, but then I need to have them be really visible because I can't see them very well if my glasses are off. And so, you know, so at some point in my life, I think, you know, I'll, I'll hit a point where there's no bifocals that'll help. I'll have a lot of trouble seeing things on a screen. And at that point, I really hope that we've come up with a lot of really good solutions for, um, you know, for like visual accessibility so that I can benefit from them as well as everyone else. Like that's, it's, and that's the thing that people need to realize. It's like, if somebody thinks like, Oh, you're focusing on all this accessibility and you're not making the game for me, you don't know what's going to happen in your life. You could end up blind. You could end up with hands that shake for the rest of your life. You could end up unable to hear. And uh, you might want the games that you love to be accessible to future you. So just get off it. <laughs> you know, I'm not talking to anyone in my chat. Everyone in my chat is awesome people. I'm not yelling at any of you. I'm yelling at the imaginary person that I just made up who's having a problem with accessibility, <laughs> with, with accessibility stuff. Whew. So Coalition says I get some I get a similar effect on my on my uh, Day Z server. He runs a Day Z server in Mexico. Uh, he says uh, my most common comment is do it like this or your server will die. Trust me, bro. Um, I just entered your server and I don't like it. Do X, Y, and Z to save your server from dying. And he's like, I don't like zero sum people who just want everything tailor made for them. Who basically is like, yeah, who, who think that basically anything that isn't their way means it's bad. Um, and instead of just accepting the fact that, you know, it's great if we could all play these games together, all enjoy them together. And if something isn't exactly like something that's made for someone else didn't steal something from you. It's OK if there's something in the game or th th that's for another person. And this, you know, affects a lot of things like um like uh, writing, actually, you, could, you know, I was just, I just saw like a snarky tweet. Like I, I'm a big Brandon Sanderson fan. I've been listening to the audiobook of the Fourth Stormlight Archive book lately. Um, I really love his stuff. I mean, I think that you know, there's here and there I've got a quibble with it. You know, it's like I don't think he's like the perfect writer, but like he's a really good writer and he does stuff that no one else can do, and it's really impressive. And I really like his his work. I like his world that he's made. Um, it's really great. I saw this snarky tweet. That was like making fun of people trying to defend Brandon Sanderson's bad prose, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> like, I like, I mean, what he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't write his books like he thinks he has to be a poet or something. He's not trying to impress you with, with the, the mellifluous flow of every sentence. He has very straightforward way of just telling you what's going on in the story and lets the story, what's happening in the story, be the entertainment which is what a lot of people like. And it's okay if someone likes that. Like, sure, if you are somebody who, like, what you want to be reading is just, like, poetry all the time and you want to read, you know, prose that is trying to impress you with how, like, purple it is, great. Go read the books that are like that because they're for you. It doesn't hurt you for me to have the book I want to read, which is like Brandon Sanderson's books. Like, I want that. It's great. It's awesome. He's very good at entertaining me and also entertaining lots and lots of people. He's successful for a reason because lots and lots of people love what he does. And that means he did it right. So like, and, you know, and it doesn't take anything away from you. Brandon Sanderson writing in a way that isn't particularly entertaining for you doesn't hurt you. There are writers that you do like. Go read them. Leave me alone. <laughs> it's not zero sum. It's not like you have to take down the writers you don't enjoy in order to have the writing you like, you get to have the writing you like, whether they get taken down or not, you know, like, yeah, I mean, there's writers that I don't like, 
I'm not going to name him here because that would be hypocritical. Uh, <laughs> there's like one in particular where I was like, like, you know, I was reading the book that they wrote and I was like, hate reading at the end. I was like, I have to see what happens at the end. But I'm hating every second of this. Um, and I and I talked about it. I was like complaining about it. But at the same time, if I was complaining about it, somebody said, actually, I like that book. Actually, I like that writer. I'd be like, oh, well, you know what? I'm ranting because it's fun to rant about things you don't like. It's not for me. It's okay if you like it would be my attitude. I wouldn't like do a tweet that's like, oh, you know, look at all these dumb buffoons trying to defend this terrible writer. I'm like, no, just like, whatever. It's fine. I'm not going to yuck your yum. <laughs> you know, I don't like that phrase, but it's the right phrase for that moment. Oji Jawafawa was making fun when I was like basically saying I'm arguing with a made up person who isn't here. He he called that a Clint Eastwood moment. Uh, fair, absolutely fair. So we got uh, yeah. So Orithau says his favorite authors are Matthew Stover, Timothy Zahn, and Pat Patricia Briggs. I've only read of those three. I've only read Zahn, and it was a very long time ago. So I don't I don't even know who they are. I should I should look him up. Um, my favorite writers that I've read recently, I get, oh, oh crap, I've forgotten the name of one of them. No. Oh, well, anyway, I'll forget that, but I'll, I'll recommend them later. Fonda Lee is really good. Uh, her Jade books, uh, which is it Jade City, is that the name of the first one? Uh, I don't remember. Anyway, they're really, really good. They're a fantasy series in a different setting than I've ever seen before. Like, you know, you're used to like the Tolkien-esque fantasy settings, right? And the like, you know, like the urban fantasy, oh, there's fairies in New York type settings. There's like a bunch of different settings like that. I have never heard this one before. Like the, 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 the Jade saga uh, it's it's basically it's set in something that is roughly like it's not exactly like any one place. It's not meant to be exactly like any one place. But if you sort of imagine that um, post-war Vietnam had magic resources in it that everyone else in the world wanted and and the story is about the like the crime families who control that resource that everyone else in the world wants. It's it's that it's like. And, and, and so it's like, it's fantasy. It's about magic. But also, it's set in sort of like 1970s Vietnam. <laughs> Not really. It's a, it's in a fantasy world. It's in, a, it's in a different world. But it's like, but it's like that sort of where you, where, where it goes. And it, it, it's just, or like, it's more like 1980s, I guess, Vietnam. Um, it's just fascinating. I just, I, I, cause just being in a place that like, that like literally, I don't think anyone has written about a place like this before that I'm aware of. I mean, obviously someone probably has, right? Cause I just, I don't know all of literature. Um, but I feel like no one has I, to me as a writer, as a reader, I had never been in a world like that. It's like, what a fascinating idea. And I just got totally immersed in it. And like, the characters are all, most of them terrible people, but you still end up liking them and they're getting really mad at them when they do bad things. You're like, Oh, right. It is completely within this person's character to do bad things. I forgot they were a bad person because I enjoyed reading them so much. Um, so there's there's just, yeah, there's a lot of fun to be had with those books. Orthas says that Matthew Stover's series, uh, uh, his first book is called, or the first book in a series that he likes is called Heroes Die. Okay, I'll have to look that up. Anyway, okay, we're just getting into, like, book talk now, and uh, that's not what my channel is. So... <laughs> Really, actually, people who came here to watch gameplay, I think more than half of this episode is me just, like, chatting with the chat. But we're having fun, and I'm enjoying it. I hope you like it. And uh, I'm very tired. My voice is tired. My brain is tired. My subscribe button is tired. It's a miracle I made a snapping noise. That was probably going to be really limp, too. But <laughs> I'm just going to go to sleep, probably, or something. Next episode. I'll see you later.